everyone, and happy belated Thanksgiving. Hopefully, everyone had a nice holiday. Last time, we got right to basically the midpoint of Chapter 3. We didn't really get too far, because as always, we have really nice and uh, powerful discussions, which is the whole point of this, right? The whole point is to open this up for a life of faith. So we got to verse 14 of chapter 3. So we are starting with verse 15. Many of you probably have a a title kind of section marker for that verse um, because what we're going to talk about today as we're going to enter into this is a new argument. This is at this point a third argument that Paul is using here to defend this great argument of this entire letter, which is, of course, as we talked about, just to review, uh, this point that Paul is trying again and again to reiterate, which is that justification, which is to say our right relationship with God comes about primarily and ultimately through faith rather than through the ceremonial workings of the law. It's through faith in Jesus Christ that justifies us. We had great discussions over the last few weeks about what faith is, what that looks like and how that's expressed. And we saw, just to review what we saw in chapter three, two arguments that Paul used towards that end, again, of saying that justification, this right relationship happens through faith rather than through the ceremonial workings of the law, the Jewish law. The first one we saw in the very beginning of chapter three had to do with just personal experience, right? He was saying, how was it that you, when you heard the gospel, how was it that you experienced your life of grace in Christ? It was through your act of faith, right? It wasn't something that you did according to the works of the law. It was through faith. And so he's saying, why are you now trying to add on to that these works of the law that the Judaizers are proclaiming as if you still, you know, that act of faith that you originally had when the gospel was preached to you wasn't enough, right? That you need to add something more, right? That's the first argument he used. The second one was, we talked about this a lot last time. This is basically the majority of our discussion last time, beginning around verse six or seven, When he introduces this, who's the character he introduces from the Old Testament? Abraham, exactly. And what's the reason he talks about Abraham? Well, he's saying essentially Abraham came about. Abraham, who's the father, as we say, continue to say today, right, in our prayers in the Roman canon, Abraham, our father in faith. He's our father in faith for the Christians, for the Jews. Obviously, he's a very important figure. Like to cite Abraham is like you're citing George Washington or something. Right? somebody who's you know this great model this great example and he says well abraham how is it that this is the second argument how is it that abraham came to right relationship with god the ceremony workings of law didn't exist at that point because those come about obviously centuries later with moses right so how was it that he came to this relationship and there was this famous phrase that we talked about abraham believed god and there in verse six abraham believed god and it was credited credited to him as righteousness We talked about how that's kind of the translation of that. It doesn't really express sometimes what that actually says, because we read that and say, what does that mean? He was, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteous. Well, what was it saying? Abraham believed God, meaning he made an act of faith. He had faith. And what happens as a result of that, it was credited, credited, can't say that, credited to him as righteousness, which is to say it was justifying. It put him in right relationship with God. So it was, it was his act of faith that put him in right relationship with God. So Abraham, this most important person in the Jewish faith, in our faith, he had this relationship faith that justified him apart from the law because the law didn't exist at that time. And remember in verse seven, we talked about this, how there's this really, what I think would be a really controversial phrase that Paul says. Everybody remember, we talked about this in verse seven, he says something that would have been, I think, really scandalous even. He uses the phrase children of Abraham. And children of Abraham, and we've talked about, would have been, even it's used in the Gospels, right, by the Pharisees and others. They're claiming, oh, who's going to be the, who's the true child of Abraham? You know, I'm the true child of Abraham. You're the true child of Abraham, meaning somebody who follows in the tradition of Abraham. And what is Paul saying here? He's saying, realize then that it is those who have faith who are children of Abraham or the true children of Abraham. So he's saying, you know, to be a true child of Abraham is not necessarily just to follow the prescriptions of the law that involves that it can involve that but more importantly it involves faith and therefore it's a it's a larger category right it can involve not just people who are those who are following the mosaic law but it can involve also all those including abraham who simply make an act of faith in god and including also christians too so that's the second argument and the third argument today we're going to talk about gets us to uh, verse 15 
And actually, he does another argument after that. So there's a fourth argument later. But the third argument um, gets us into today, we're going to talk about some things we already talked about a little bit, like what's the point of the law in the first place? Why was the law given? What was its purpose? Um, so we get into that because the third argument has to do basically with the whole idea of what a covenant is. What is a covenant? What is a, a human covenant? What is a divine covenant? And then what is the law in relation to that covenant? So that's what we're going to get into today. So why don't we, again, we're going to skip to verse 15. The section marker for me says the law did not nullify the promise. That's the, you probably have different uh, little titles there, but that's essentially what we're going to be talking about today. So who wants to read? Um, let's just start with uh, verse 15. I'm going to read that. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Um, to give a human example, brethren, no one annuls even a man's will or adds to it once it has been ratified. Good. So I like your translation. It's a little different than mine, but it, it, it brings out the fact that he's giving another argument here. He's saying, now let me give you another example of why justification happens through faith and not through works of the law. And he says it's a human example, meaning he's going to be talking about, let's look at just what we understand on a human level about this whole idea of wills and covenants and promises and all that. And he says in human terms, he's talking about a human thing, any will, any human will. So he's talking about like, you know, even like a will and test, last will and testament or any kind of human kind of contract. And the way he says it, no one can annul or amend. Now, this is kind of sounds kind of funny because we would say, OK, contracts, yes, we do amend you know human contracts we do amend and we do change right even like sometimes marriage contracts things like that right but what he's speaking about is again in the human terms in in the tradition of the day right a, a last will and testament was something that you did not touch right you did not amend you did not annul it was you know somebody had given this last will right and because of that you would say okay this this has this is sacrosanct essentially it's not going to be changed so he's saying if we believe this on a human level, that if some if some covenant or if some will is given on a human level, we believe that can't be annulled or amended. Then what about if it's God himself who makes this promise or God himself who makes this this last will and testament, this covenant? Right. Then even more so if we if we believe on a human level, you can't change it or annul it. Then even more so if that happens that God is giving it, then it's even more sacrosanct. Right. And then he goes on in verse 16 to say, so what, what, what human will, what, I mean, sorry, what will, what testament am I talking about? He's talking about the promise that was given to Abraham and to his descendant or his descendants. So we're saying if God gave at the beginning a, a promise, a testament to Abraham, if this was given by God himself, and if we believe that a human testament or will can't be changed, that even more so we believe that this promise, this testament given to Abraham by God himself cannot be changed right so it's even more so he's he's saying how important this this covenant that cannot be changed is doesn't and it, what he's basically going to be implying is it can't be changed by the law either right the law even though it comes later it's not gonna be able to change this this promise that was given to abraham now i want to get in a little bit here to what this promise to abraham is because he doesn't really describe that obviously the jewish people would have known what the promise to abraham is but we, we're probably a little bit familiar with the story of Abraham, right? Story of, of Abraham being called. This is from the book of Genesis. We'll actually go, I'm, I'll go back and, and read it to you just so you don't have to go all the way back in your Bible. But so Abraham is, you know, called to be the father of the chosen people, right? God calls him out of his homeland, Ur of the Chaldeans. He says, go into the land of Canaan, which we now understand to be like the Holy Land, the promised land. He says, go into the land of Canaan. And he promises, does anybody remember what, what does God promise when we're talking about this promise, this testament, this thing that this God is giving to Abraham? Does anybody remember particularly what the promise to Abraham and his descendant involves? What is it in particular that he's giving? Well, it's in the land of milk and honey. Yes, land. That's one very important part of it. So he's promising, God promises to uh, Abraham and to his descendants, meaning the chosen people, but also meaning, as Paul's going to say, Christians, the land. And then also there's another element that's very important. Descendants. Descendants, exactly. So yes, exactly. But we both said that he'll be the father. I'm going to I'll read the exact thing here. So, so yeah, the covenant that God gives Abraham, he says, he basically takes him out of nowhere. He's like, takes him out of nowhere and says, I'm a, he says, leave your, leave your land. I mean, it's kind of crazy when you read it. He says, leave your land, your native land, and go into this new land of Canaan. Yeah, it's owned by other people right now. And there's many other nations there. But I'm going to give that land to you. And 
I'm going to bless you with many descendants who, as he says, are going to be more numerous than, you know, the stars of the sky, the sand and the shore of the sea. Crazy stuff that you would hear, you know, and Abraham's thinking, what, what is this? How could this possibly be? Right. But this was the promise when Paul is talking about the promise that was given to Abraham. And it's more than just a promise. It's also, you know, God creates a covenant as we hear in Genesis 14, 15, right? He creates a covenant with Abraham. What is a covenant? I think we talked about this before. I, I, when I describe this to a lot of the married couples that come in for marriage prep, right? The, one of the first things we talk about is what's the difference between a covenant, marriage as a covenant, as a sacrament in the church, and marriage as just a contract, right? A contract is, you know, something that you enter into. If, if you want to change it, you change the contract, you amend the contract, you put in an escape clause in the contract, you, you get a new, void the contract, get a new contract, right? It can be changed. It could be, what is a covenant? It's indissoluble, right? It's lifelong and indissoluble, meaning it can't, it can't be changed. It can't be broken, right? That's what Jesus himself says, right? And what, what we hear from the scriptures, right? What God has joined together, let man not put asunder. What else is the difference between a contract and covenant? Covenant is, well, a contract, I would say, is 50-50, right? Each gives their own part, and that's kind of how it works. Covenant is total gift of self, one to the other. No strings attached, you know, no exceptions, right? So God makes a covenant with Abraham, who's a human being, which is crazy. Like God, who's a divine being, makes this indissoluble, full gift of self to a human being, Abraham. And he says to him, I will give you this land and these ascendants. It's, a, it's an amazing, we don't really think about how amazing that would be, you know, that God is making covenant, how much he trusts a human being. And he makes this covenant with him and says he's going to give him the land and descendants. I'm just going to read. So this is after, so we're just kind of really breezing over this whole thing. But if you remember the story of Abraham, right? Abraham's called out. There's a covenant that's made, covenantal relationship with him and God. And that's reflected in the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision, right? God gives him this, this sign of the covenant that he's, he's given. Then there's the testing of this covenant. Does anybody remember how Abraham, the, the major way in which Abraham is tested by God? Yeah, he has to, he's told to sacrifice his son, right, in Mount Moriah. That's, that was the, that's a testing of the covenant, saying, okay, I'm making this covenant with you. Now, if you really want to, you know, show that you believe in this covenant, this is what it takes. And when, when Abraham passes the test in a certain sense, what happens, this covenant, this promise is reiterated to him. And this is the most kind of uh, elaborate way in which it's stated. So I'll read this here. He says, God says to him, this is Genesis chapter 22, verses 17 through like 18. God says, I will bless you, Abraham, and I will make your descendants as countless as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the gates of their enemies. And in your descendants, all the nations of the earth will find blessing because you obeyed my command. So because of your faith, again, this is all about faith, because of your faith, because you obeyed my command, this is the promise that is given to you. And again, what does it involve? Land. Land. And it involves descendants. And he even goes further here. He says, your descendants will take possession of the gates of your enemies. And you're just in your descendants, all the nations of the earth will find blessing. Now, this is where we get back to Galatians. What is St. Paul saying here? Just in this verse after again, he's saying, God has made this, this covenant, this, this will, this testament with a human being, with Abraham. And it's obviously even more important than any human, you know, will or testament that we would understand and therefore it can't be annulled it can't be changed it can't be taken away okay that's all true and in verse 16 he says now the promise that promise we just read was made to abraham and to his descendants he says it does not say into descendants plural as referring to many but as referring to one and to your descendant now who does paul say the descendant is here christ so this is a big point. This is a huge point. Paul is interpreting, he's making his own interpretation, which we now is, you know, believe in as Christians. It's, it's scriptural. He's interpreting those promises that were made because in the original language, right, in, in Genesis, it says when, when God says, I'm making this promise to you, Abraham, and to your descendants, it's actually a singular to you and to your descendants. It, what's called a collective singular, meaning it's a singular word, but it's rep, it's referring to a collection of things. But he sees the singular and he says, oh, that's referring to Christ. So he's saying God made a promise 
to Abraham and to his descendant, who was Christ. Now, we know Christ actually was the descendant of Abraham, right? If you read the genealogy at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, Abraham is a direct, you know, he, a direct ancestor of, you know, in the line of, in the lineage, a direct ancestor. So in that sense, he's a descendant. But also what he's saying is Christ also involves, like if we believe we're also the body of Christ, right? We're also members of Christ. We're members of the body of Christ. So what is he saying? He's saying the promise was made to Christ and also to all of Christ's members, which means us. Would, was St. Paul's first one to give that interpretation that offering is meant to Christ? The reason why I ask that is I'm going to assume that the Israelites, when they read that verse, they were probably thinking, okay, this promise is to Abraham and to his descendant Isaac, as opposed to Ishmael, because he had two children, and the promise only came through one. So mm -hmm. at what point in our understanding of, of Christology do we, was Paul the first person to say this word actually is referring to Christ? Yeah, so Paul, th that is his novelty. Paul's novelty is this, okay. is, is this connection to Christ. Now, the Jewish people would have read the singular and the plural, like you're saying, like in a more historical sense, they would have been saying, they would have been seeing this as Isaac, right? But they also read it in the collective sense, meaning they referred, to, they saw it as the chosen people of Israel, right? So God will bless the chosen people of Israel as he blessed Abraham with this kind of, but what is, so what is Paul saying? He's saying, well, no, he's saying it's bigger than this. And again, this is, goes to what does children of Abraham mean, right? To be a child of Abraham, to be a descendant of Abraham who, receives a blessing, it doesn't just involve if you're part of this one ethnic group, right? It means, and this is where this is all going, right? It means if you are a follower of Christ, which is to say, if you are somebody who makes an act of faith in God, doesn't matter what nation you're from, doesn't matter what, you know, your background is, doesn't matter if you're following the works of the law, you know, if that's been given to you to follow, right? If you make an act of faith and you are considered a follower of Christ, which means you are part of you are one of the people to whom this promise by God made to Abraham and to his sentence is made. And so, again, let's go back to what is the, and this is something that we can do now. So we as Christians, again, we believe following St. Paul that this promise has been made to us. So let's read the promise again and let's see how has this promise been fulfilled, we would understand, in Christ, in the story of Christ, but also more broadly in our lives as Christians, like in the church today. So again, what's the promise? I will bless you. And make your descendants as countless as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the gates of their enemies. And in your descendants, all the nations of the earth will find blessing because you obeyed my command. <laughs> so the cool thing when we read that is like that has been fulfilled in the church, right? I mean, all nations, like doesn't matter what nation of the world, right? All nations can become part of, of the church, of the Catholic church. Descendants are as countless as the stars as the, as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore, meaning we're, you know, billions wide throughout the world, right? How will we interpret this? Your descendants will take possession of the gates of their enemies, which is to say, you know, this actually is interesting. It goes back to what Christ says to Peter, right? That the gates of the netherworld will not prevail against the church, right? Meaning the powers of evil will have no power over the Christian because they follow God and they have the spirit within them. So I just think it's cool how this is, you know, this promise that was made thousands and thousands of years ago to Abraham, which Paul interprets as also made to the Christian and to, to Christ and to the Christian, is fulfilled in the church, right? Kind of cool. It's not fulfilled just in the chosen people, right? The chosen people meaning the, this one nation of Israel. That was the mission, right? The Old Testament was preparing them to be a light to all nations, right? But they they had closed themselves inward and weren't prepared to receive the Messiah. And so the Messiah says, you know, if the chosen people in large part have turned away from me, then I go to the nations, the Gentiles, right? To meaning the whole world and the church now is fulfilling this promise. And this is all of what St. Paul is saying here. And, and St. Paul is the first one to say this. Certainly there are probably other Christians who were reading the scriptures, but he's reading the old Testament and he's like, Wait, this promise is not just they the Judaizers, Judaizers want to say that this promise is just for, you know, this one nation, people who ethnically are part of this one nation who follow this one, you know, set of commandments. No, he's saying this promise actually is for all Christians and actually is only we only see its fulfillment and its realization in the Christian world, right? In the church. <clears throat> 
So I have yes, a question go ahead. about that. Yeah. It sounds like you're saying that the gates of our enemies are metaphorical. So, um, at least for Christians, it's um, it's just evil, right? Evil influences. Is that what the gates of the enemies refers? To? Yes, a great question. So yes, I did give a more what's called a spiritual interpretation of that passage. Now, anything in Scripture, this comes from the early fathers, right? Anything in Scripture is can have you know, multiple, many different meanings and many different levels of meaning because it's the word of God. So it's, it's replete with meaning, but usually we talk about there being like a literal or historical meaning and a spiritual meaning. So a literal or historical meaning would be what, what role did this have in this particular historical narrative that's being discussed? And the more spiritual meaning would be, what is the, what is the more kind of like in a certain sense, a looser, higher sense of, of it that has a meaning for not just this historical period, but for all you know time. So in this case, that particular passage, right, he will destroy whatever, they will destroy the gates of their enemies or whatever. What's the more historical, literal meaning of that? Well, in the descent, the actual descendants like Isaac and the other descendants of Israel, they actually did like take over the promised land. So they like by war and conquest, I mean, you read the book of Joshua, right? So literally and historically what that, that means is they actually did take over the land. Now, what does that mean more spiritually for all generations for us who as Christians? I would interpret it as, yes, what are our enemies, right? Our enemies are, um, what does St. Paul say? Our enemies are not necessarily, you know, the things of this world. They are, in a certain sense, you know, our persecutors. But who are true enemies? He said it's the principalities and powers that are invisible, meaning the the forces of the evil one, right? Evil, sin, all these kind of things. So what, what this is meaning in a spiritual sense is the descendants of of Abraham, of Israel, meaning the Christian people, right? The chosen people of God. We are able to overthrow the gates of, of sin. How? Through grace, through the sacraments, right? God has given us his life so that we can, so that sin has no power over us, right? If we, if we turn to God and receive his grace and all those kind of things. So, so it's the same thing with the passage about descendant and descendants, right? There's a historical, literal meaning of it, meaning Isaac and his descendant, but there's also the spiritual meaning, which is what Paul is saying. The spiritual meaning of this passage is who are the descendants? It's all Christians, right? Very powerful. And so obviously St. Paul, like this is, this is maybe something that we can, maybe you have ideas or thoughts on, but just kind of more tangential to this. Like it shows you, first of all, it shows you how, I want to say how smart Paul was, right? That he was able to make this, but it wasn't just, it's not just about smarts, right? It's not just about genius. It's the fact that this is what we mean when we say that the scriptures are inspired, meaning it's the Holy Spirit that inspired him to make this amazing. Because think about how amazing this is. He's going all the way back to the book of Genesis and he's seeing something there and he's seeing how it refers to Christ. He's he's bringing what we would understand to be the true interpretation of this passage out. Right. So it shows that not only is he intelligent, but I think more so it's not just all about intelligent. He's inspired and he was open to this inspiration, like to, to be able to make this connection you have to be somebody who first of all knows the hebrew scriptures back and forward but also somebody who's praying with them and reflecting on them and that's how this insight came to him it's not like he just like picked up genesis and was like oh here we go like boom you know he made this association so it shows us how we have to be like this is what we do when we're when we're doing lexio divina right we're reading the scriptures very prayerfully very carefully and we're open to the spirit and we're trying to make connections as to what the lord is trying to say to us which is also what we're doing in this class too. So that's kind of cool. So, so any 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 other thoughts or comments on that? So um, where were we? Just around verse seventeen. So that's all. Basically, that's all the things that he's saying. It, it's two verses here, sixteen and seventeen, where he doesn't really explain all of his reasoning and all the kind of things behind it. But what it, he's essentially saying, all the things we just talked about, which is to say, this huge point that the promise to Abraham is also the promise to us as Christians. And we are the, in the church, we see the realization of the promise made to Abraham thousand years ago. So now entering back into his line of argument, somebody want to read, uh, let's do verse 17 and 18. 17, Go ahead, yeah. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not know a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance is by the law, it is no longer by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Yes. So, so here then he's going back to 
this idea of, okay, if we believe that this covenant, like this huge idea that this God made this covenant with a human being, with Abraham, and that that covenant still exists, like it has existed since then, it can't be annulled, it can't be taken away, it still exists even today, and and the people who are the beneficiaries of the covenant are Christians, right, followers of God, those who make an act of faith, then the law, he says, how does the law factor into that? Well, if the law came in the middle, right, 450, 430 years after that promise to Abraham, this law comes around, does that change or annul or take away the promise? And the answer would be no, right? How could it? Because if God is making this, this covenant that exists for Abraham and for all of his descendants, meaning the chosen people, Christians, even onto today, then the law comes around. It obviously can't take away that, right? It can't, it can't change what is it? Cause then it would be like, God, it was like, Oh wait, I made a mistake. You know, even though I made this like really, as we just heard this amazing promise to your descendants. Well now, no, it's, I'm, I, you know, I re- reconsidered and now you have to do this instead. No. So the law clearly, and as he's going to get into in verse 19, the law clearly had a different function. The function of the law was not meant to replace the covenant made to Abraham. It was meant to, in some way, as we're going to see, help, help, right, in some way, but it wasn't to take, it wasn't to replace, right? And this was what the Judaizers were trying to say. They were trying to essentially say that they were basically trying to replace the covenant made to Abraham with just the law, right? To say that the law now somehow supersedes the covenant. Meaning, so if you want to be, if you want to truly be a beneficiary of the covenant with Abraham, then you have to, it doesn't matter who you are from what nation you are, you have to follow all of the prescriptions of the law. So they're trying to replace that with the covenant. Whereas he's saying, no, the covenant existed, it always existed, it can't be changed, right? So then what is the law for? This is what he gets to in verse 19. This is very important because we talked about this a little bit last week, how you know, when we, we we focus so much on faith and faith and faith and faith, it can seem like, oh, does Paul just think that the law is terrible? Remember we talked about this last week, that the law is terrible and like works of any kind of good works are terrible and we should never do them. And all we have to do is have faith and then we can go sit on the sofa and do nothing. And because some Christians do believe this, right? You make an act of faith and then you're totally fine. You can just do whatever you want. And you're once saved, always saved, right? Is that what Paul's saying? Because some of them would read this and say, it seems like he's really going hard against the law. and He doesn't want anything to do with the law. The answer is, of course, no. And we talked about how everything is perspective and context, right? The reason that Paul is so hard against the law in this passage is because the people that he's speaking against are saying that the law is the only thing that matters. and all that. So, of course, he's going to be a little bit more, you know, um, you know, forceful against the law. But as we see here, he actually is very he's a, he's a Jewish person. He's a Pharisee, right? He actually is somebody who very much appreciates the law. And it was a gift given, as he talks about here. And in, in some cases, he says, if you are somebody who is following the law already, then you can go ahead and continue to follow it, right? So he he does have a great respect for the law. So what was the role of the law then? And this is what he gets into in verses 19 and on. So somebody want to read? Um, let's just start with 19, because there's a lot here. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Do you want Good. So then why the law? What's the answer he gives? We talk about this a little bit a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yes, as exactly as a custodian. So the word he uses is custodian. Actually, we'll talk a little bit about the image he uses in Greek of what that actually is. So the custodian, but but because of what? What was the reason? Yes, because of it, it was added for transgressions or for sins. I like the way that he says in verse 19, it was added. Why is that an important word? Because he's saying it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't superseded. It wasn't replacing. It wasn't like, what is the verb he uses? He says it was added, meaning the covenant still remains, right? But there was this extra thing that was added on because of sins and transgressions. So I gave the example like a little couple weeks ago about, you know, if you're, you know, those who are parents and everything and you, you, you know, the ideal is you would, you, you don't want to have, you know, it would be great if you could have kids that didn't have to have really, really strict rules and penalties. And you could just kind of say, oh, here's the wonderful things that you that you can have and all these wonderful things that I can give you. And isn't it so wonderful? So why don't you just kind of, uh, you know, do what I have to say, because I'm the one who's giving you all those things. Right. 
obviously we know that doesn't work, right? Because then the children are going to do what they want to do, right? So then you have to say, you know, it's not ideal, but I do have to put in these strict rules with strict penalties because otherwise you're going to transgress, right? That's kind of the relationship that we have with God. God is like this one who's giving us all these wonderful things. And he's saying, here's all these, it's like Adam and Eve in the garment. Here's all these wonderful things I'm going to give you. I'm the, I'm the giver of every good thing. I am going to ask you to do certain things, right? Because I know what's best for you. But so long as you do that, you're going to receive all these things. And it would be ideal if humanity like Adam and Eve could have just done that. But of course, we sin, we transgress. And so what happens, there have to be these rules to, to help us on the right path. That is what the law was all about, right? God gave this wonderful covenant to Abraham, but over the course of four centuries, like 430 years, what, what do we keep reading the Old Testament, right? We'll keep, it's like the story of like, I like to say the, the story of the Old Testament is just like one failure after a bigger failure, after a bigger failure, after the biggest failure of all, which is they miss the Messiah that, that comes to them, right? So there's all these failures and God's like, oh, you know, and it, this is again and again and again. So the covenant doesn't change, but yet he says, I got to add this other thing in to help basically to help get rid of the sins and transgressions as much as we can. That's why the law came about. So it's a good thing. It's a gift. And to use the image that he uses, he used the image of a custodian or a tutor or like a, a nanny or something, you know, the image, actually the, the word that he uses in Greek here, when he's talking a little bit later about, let me see what it says in my translation. We'll see what other people say. Um, where is this? disciplinarian this is go, this is going down a little bit into verse 24 and 25 but the word that at least my translation has here is disciplinarian which is a little bit more i think that's a little in english it just kind of is a more clunky kind of thing what is if you skip down to verse 25 what do people have there for now now the faith has come we are no longer under a disciplinarian what do people have custodian, custodian. anybody else have a different word sometimes you might see tutor yeah so what is the word in greek the word in Greek refers to, it's kind of an interesting thing. So Pythagogos, who was somebody who, it wasn't a, a teacher of a student or a child, the Pythagogos. It was somebody who basically, literally the word means somebody who led the child. So it was somebody who, you know, the parents say, okay, the, the child has to go to school and has to learn something. So the Pythagogos person, the disciplinarian, whoever you want to call it, will lead the child to the school and then leave the, give the child to the teacher. So what he's saying is the law isn't even necessarily the teacher, right? It's it's the law is the thing, the person that kind of takes the child and says, okay, let me lead you to the school and then I'll leave you there and give you the teacher. So the, it's like the, the person who's making sure the child doesn't run off and go try to, you know, go somewhere else rather than go to school or try to go do something stupid on the way to school, right? The, the law is the, 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 the custodian is the person that's leading the child, which would be us, right, to the school so that they can get there and be... Exactly. Because if the child didn't have anybody lead him to school, they'd be running around doing whatever they want to do. Right. So you have to have something to kind of give you that order that allows you to have some structure. Right. That's going to allow you to move forward. Um, and we need that as human beings. Right. We need structure. We need order. So that's why the gift is that's why the law is a, is a good thing. And again, this is why we need to focus more on this section, because, again, we everything that we've heard, we might think, oh, the law is terrible. And Paul's saying it's terrible and it's bad. No. It's actually a very good thing, right? It was it was given as this kind of way to to lead us further on to to help us to to do good things and to help us toward achieving the promise. So why then the law? It was added for transgressions. Until the descendant came to whom the promise had been made. Who is the descendant again? As Paul sees it. Christ. So he's saying the law was given in order to try to minimize our transgressions, our sins, until the descendant came, not just the descendant, but, and this is where he reiterates what he had just said, this amazing insight he had on Genesis 22, until the descendant came to whom the promise had been made. So he's saying the promise of Abraham was made to, to Abraham, but also to his descendant, to Christ primarily. And therefore Christ, when Christ comes, that's the fulfillment of the promise. The fulfillment of that promise that was made to Abraham comes about when Christ comes. And therefore, this law that was given in the meantime is no longer necessary. 
Now, it's not to say that the law is then completely taken away and thrown out and there's nothing to do with it. No, it's saying that it's no longer necessary because we now have the fulfillment of the promise of force. This is why St. Paul, what is his, what did they decide as we read earlier in Galatians, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right? What, what is the decision that's made by the early church or the Council of Jerusalem? They say, we're not getting rid of the law completely, but we're, we're saying it's not necessary for one to have salvation. So if you're a Jew and you're already following the law and you come to faith in Christ, you can continue to follow it so long as you don't then try to say this is necessary that all Christians now have to follow this, right? So it's no longer necessary because we have the fulfillment until the descendant, Christ, came to whom the promise had been made, then we don't need it, right? Because we have freedom from our sins in Christ, the grace coming from Christ. So we're in this picture. Where does the Ten Commandments fit in? Because Levitical law is one thing. The Ten Commandments were separate things. Yes, exactly. So are, are we talking old law, new law, or both? Yes, so this we refer to. So the so Moses also is the one to whom you know the Decalogue is given, meaning right. the Ten Commandments. Um, so this would so we understand when we're talking about the Jewish law, the Mosaic law. Um, it includes things like that, but we understand it more to mean, and, and they would have understood in the in the early church to mean, like the for for instance the ceremonial laws of um, worship, like the the how worship because there that's a big part of the um, the the law is if you read like you know some of the early books of the old testament it's about god telling them this is how i want to be worshipped with this amount of you know whatever uh you know phylacteries and incense mm -hmm. all these kind of things. so that that part ceremonial but also things like the dietary laws you know think foods that would have been um you know forbidden and non-forbidden um whereas the moral law meaning for the most part the moral law that comes to the decalogue would have been something that that perdures, meaning it's something that would continue. Why? Because it's something that reflects what God intended from the beginning. So it's not something that's added in later on, but it's something that existed for all, you know, from the beginning, you know, there was this expectation of, of the moral law and that, that was for the early peoples, you know, Adam, Eve and onward, and also for the Christians. So it's something that is throughout, but the things that were added, again, this is why this word added is important. So the things in the, in the Mosaic law that are added in for that time, are the things that wouldn't be binding on all people. So for instance, we don't follow, you know, we don't read the Old Testament and say, okay, it says this is how God has to be worshiped. Therefore at mass, we have to do all these things. Now we don't do that. Why? Because that's something that was added on. Um, the dietary laws, um, all these kind of things. So um, even something like circumcision, now circumcision obviously predates that because it comes from uh, the time of Abraham. But the idea that that has to be that that is necessary for all people to have, that would be something that would have been added in again for transgressions. So anything that was added, in, whereas the the old the the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments is reflecting. It's not that that was added. It's not like up to that time it was OK to murder. Up to that time it was OK to commit adultery. No, it's it was restating what had already existed. Right. Um, whereas the other things in, in the Mosaic Law were actually added in. So those are the things that would then be no longer necessary for um, for salvation. Gotcha. Yes, go ahead. So it's the descendant, the singular. Yeah. Christ is it. Even though they talk about the sand of the seashore and the stars in the sky, it does, Abraham does get the one descendant, so that's Christ. It's interesting because that can kind of flow by us. Yes. Yeah, so it is a singular in, in Hebrew. However, um, it's what we would call, and there's always fun things in, in, you know, ancient language, grammar, right? A collective singular, meaning it's a singular word, but it has, it has also, it can have sort of like an implicit plural meaning, which even the early peoples that, that read this text would have understood. Like they would have understood primarily it's talking about a singular. And again, what are they talking about? Primarily Isaac, right? But again, knowing that this is the word of God and it's replete with all these other meanings, there is more to this than just saying, so Paul is really, he's really going more and, and kind of in his interpretation here, which again is canonical, it's scriptural. He's really siding more with a singular part of it. But at the same time, he too is understanding this has a plural meaning too, which is why he says it means Christ, but it also means all Christians, right? And as much as all Christians are part of Christ or we're a body of Christ. But you're right, it's something that we can pass over so quickly and just think, oh, it's talking about descendants, but in re reality, the primary meaning of it is singular, yeah, and that has a big meaning. So any more comments or? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Something you said struck me as far as how we worship God. Mm -hmm. um, is that similar to what the 
now um, with this going away from the Latin mass? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah. So that is something that we forget about. So in the Old Testament, God has, this is kind of funny, but so he says, you know, what is the first commandment that we are to have no other gods before him? We are to worship him as, as the one true God. The biggest commandment in the Old Testament, right, that Jesus cites from Deuteronomy is, you know, the Lord your God is one alone. You are, you are to worship the one God alone. But then he says, he doesn't just say, worship me and then figure it out how you're supposed to worship me. He actually tells them, this is how you're supposed to worship me. This is the exact, like literally down to, down to the cubits. He says, this is what the temple is supposed to look like. This is how big it's supposed to be. This is what you're supposed to put here. This is what you're supposed to do there. This is when you're supposed to celebrate this uh, festival. This many weeks for this festival, that many weeks for that festival. So he's very clear. He says, this is how you're supposed to worship. Now, why does he do that? We can say, well, that's, that's stupid. Why would we do that? Because of our transgressions. Because he knows, God knows, if he tells us to worship him, but we don't give, he doesn't give us prescriptions, then we're, we're, we're lazy, we're sinful people. So we're probably saying, oh, we'll do it, uh, but we'll do that. And then we're probably going to do the least common denominator, right? We'll do something very easy or something simple. So he says, no, if you want to worship me, this is how you're supposed to do it. And again, a lot of this was added in as part of the law, but the reason it was added in was because otherwise people wouldn't have done it, right? They wouldn't have done it all. So the church has the same mentality today, right? Which is people can say, oh, why does the church say, oh, there's an obligation to go to mass on Sunday? Can I just worship God in my own way? Or why does the mass have to be, in this particular way, right? Can't we just do whatever we want? Like, can't we read whatever we want? Can we? The reason is because the church is our mother, right? Our, it's a parent. There's a parent parental relationship. The church knows that if we're just left, if if we just if the church just basically said, okay, you can just honor the Sabbath day however you want to do it, you know, just do whatever you want to do, or you can gather together in your church and do whatever you want to do to to honor the Sabbath day. What do you think would happen? <laughs> like, let's be honest. Let's be honest here. Yeah, St. Mary's, you might have a really nice St. Joseph, you might have a nice thing, but you might have other places where nothing really happens or people kind of forget about it because they don't see why it's important. So the church creates these, what we would say are rules, but what are rules created for? To help us, to help us move forward. So we're saying this is the standard, right? You can have certain creativity within the standard, but this is a standard. This is the expectation. These are the obligations um, because if left to our own devices, we're not going to we're probably not going to, because of our sins and transgressions, we're probably not going to do what we're supposed to do. So the church does continue. Um, and actually, you had this point a couple of weeks ago, too, similar thing. You were you made the point of, you know, we talk about how the Jewish law has whatever, 613 some odd commandments. And you said, basically, well, if you look at like an examination of conscience, it seems like there's a lot of like commandments in there, too. And so, it, so it's the same, same point you're making today, which is essentially that, you know, the church does, in a certain sense, um, you know, make present again, the idea of law, of, of rules, of a custodian, all these kind of things, right? Again, why? Because there's this idea that we're sinful human beings and we're going to need to, and sometimes even we need to add things in as time goes on to help people to achieve the promise and the covenant. Now, at the same time, it's not to say that these are necessary, meaning could, you know, in certain cases, could the church, you know, change certain things about the way in which these expectations these laws are given for instance how the mass is celebrated yes there is an authority given to the church to alter the way in which worship is given right obviously there's certain things that can't be changed right you can't change you can't say okay now we're going to have the mass we're going to consecrate you know uh whatever um pork and like soda no why because that was something that was given by christ himself right bread and wine so we can't change that but there's certain things we could like the language right there's nothing from the scriptures or tradition that says it has to be in this this particular language um so there are certain things we can change um things like eating meat on fridays people say oh the church changed I just was bringing this up at the rca class last night oh the church changed now we only have to eat meat or we only have to eat fish on fridays in lent and not in the rest so the church is changing at all so you know it takes away all these arguments about the church being perennial and all this. no these are certain laws and prescriptions that were added again that's the key word added in over the course of time because the church has that authority because of our sins and transgressions, but could be changed. Whereas there's other things, this goes back to what you were just saying, other things that cannot be changed because they come to us from God himself, like the Ten Commandments, right? right? The, certain things are the moral law, but all other things can be added, can be also changed based on what will best help us as simple human beings to achieve the promise. So that was a great point. Any other questions or? Let's see, so we have, we got some more time. So. Um,
So we're still on verse 19. So a lot, a lot of stuff we just talked. So that's why this verse is so important. So why is the law? Because of our transgressions. Until the descendant came to whom the promise had been made, Christ. And now he talks a little bit more about the law. It was promulgated by angels at the hand of a mediator. Who was the mediator that gave, that received the law and gave it to the people? Moses, exactly. So remember, Moses of Mount Sinai, he receives the Ten Commandments, which also, at that time, he's also receiving, you know, we would understand the law, you know, the prescriptions. And that is then given to the people. So why does he make this point? Because we would say, okay, it's in the Old Testament, actually, the fact that the law was given on a mountain to Moses, who was like the head of the people, um, and it was by the hands of angels, you know, that this was given, that would actually give a lot of credence to the law, right? And that's why that was done, because it was meant to show the people, this is not just like some guy writing this on his own. No, this is like coming from God himself. But Paul is actually using it. This is really funny. He's he's using this in, for a, a reverse meaning. He's saying it was given by mediators, by human being, by angels, by created beings. And therefore, it has less of an authority and a value than the covenants given to Abraham, which was given what? Was it given through a mediator? No, it was given directly from God's mouth to Abraham. So he's saying there was no mediators. There was no need to like play this up to make people believe it. No, it was given directly. The covenant, the promise given to Abraham was given directly by God to Abraham. Whereas the law was given through this mediation. Um, so he's just using this to say essentially, again, this is where he's really, his sort of genius comes forth, right? And his interpretation of the Old Testament is he's taking something that in the Old Testament was used to really prop up the law. He's actually saying, oh, it makes, puts it down a few pegs because it came through mediators and not from God himself, right? So there's, again, it's not to say that it's not important, the law. It's to say that it has a secondary relationship as related to the, the covenant, the promise. And then in verse 20, he kind of says what he's what we just talked about. Now, there is no mediator when only one party is involved and God is one. So he's saying when the covenant was given to Abraham and to his descendant, it was God speaking to, and this is actually really interesting from a theological perspective, a Christological perspective, because he's saying, Paul is saying here, the, co the covenant was given by God to Christ, who is God. So it's God giving the covenant to Abraham and to Christ, but to God. So he's saying when there's no there's no mediator that's needed, when the party, there's only one party involved in the covenant. So this is weird. Usually the covenant has two parties, but he's saying the covenant is God to God. And God is one. So therefore, there's no need for a mediator that shows how much, you know, more important the covenant is than the law. Why is it so interesting Christologically? We've talked about this a couple of times over the course of the, the class, but it sounds crazy. But there's some scholars today who would read St. Paul and say, oh, Paul didn't really believe Christ was God. Right. He believes he's like a secondary or like a, a really special being, but not really God. You read this verse and it, it literally he's literally saying God is one, meaning God the Father is God, and Christ is God. So this promise was given by God to God. Very interesting stuff. And all of this he's just packing into these, these verses. That's why this is such an interesting letter, because it's some of the other letters he kind of says more about what he's thinking, but this he kind of just is packing. He's like just writing, writing it all down right away, and it's all kind of packed in there verse by verse. Um, why don't we have somebody just read the last two verses, so 21 and 22. This, is gonna, this concludes this argument, this third argument that he's making. 21, 22. Oh, yeah, sure. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law has been given which could make alive, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture consigned all things to sin, that what was promised to faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Good. So this is the conclusion of his whole, this last verse 22, very difficult verse. This is a verse where one of these ones where you read this and say, what the heck is he trying to say here? You know, because it seems so strange, but we'll talk about this. So that's going to take a look. But 21 is pretty much what we already just talked about, right? He's saying, so was, was the law somehow, like the Judaizers would want to say, was the law somehow put in in opposition to the covenant made to Abraham and his descendant? Was the law somehow superseding? Was it somehow challenging? No, obviously not. Again, this is why that word added is so important. It was added in order to help us 
for a temporary, you know, period for a certain amount of time until the one to whom the promise, God to whom the promise was made, comes. Because he says here, this is kind of a side point, for if a law had been given that could bring life, then righteousness would in reality come from the law. He's essentially saying a law can't bring us life, right? It can't justify us. It can't bring us into life. It's a custodian. This is why that image of the custodian is so important. The law is like that, the pedagogos who leads us on the way and then gives us to the one who can actually give us life, right? But it's not the what can do it itself, right? So that's essentially what he's saying here. Now we get to this last verse. But scripture, my translation here, I, I'd be interested to see what others say. You, yours said consigned. But scripture consigned, or mine says confined, all things under the power of sin. That's the real part that's really confusing. That through faith in Jesus Christ, the promise might be given to those who believe. What does other people have for that first part of the verse? Do you have consigned or confined, or do you have other things? Confined. Does everybody have confined all things, or does people have other things after consigned or confined? I have something totally different. Let's hear it. But the scripture says that the whole world is under the power of sin. So that is very interesting because that, so this this is an interesting kind of example in translation of the scriptures is so important, right? This is written in Greek, Old Testament for the most part is written in Hebrew. So we're, we're, we're trying, we're reading a translation of an ancient text. So it's always going to be, that's why it helps. Actually, the early fathers would do this. They would take multiple translations and put them right next to each other so that they could try from that to come to what the what the original is trying to say. So that actually is interesting because that is really an attempt to basically, the, the one we have here that most people have is really the most literal way of just trying to translate kind of almost like word for word from the Greek. But that is more trying to interpret, you know, it's still faithful to what the text is saying, but it's how we actually interpret this passage. What is it trying to say? And it is, is what you, you just said, which is essentially to say that scripture tells us that all things are, you know, in some way under the power of sin. When you read it in our translation, it says, but scripture can find all things under the power of sin. It makes it sound like scripture, God's word, is somehow making all things, you know, under the power of sin. It's very strange what that's saying. Um, but how do we interpret this? How did the early church interpret this? That what does scripture reveals to us, the law reveals to us, which is obviously the law comes to us in scripture, right? That, you know, essentially all things are the power of sin, which essentially means we are sinful human beings, right? We can't, we're not able to, you know, as much as we want to, we can never get rid of the fact that we're, we have concupiscence, which means we have a weakness in doing the good. After the fall, after Adam and Eve, we all have this, this weakness in doing what's good. We're all prone to sin and we are going to sin. There's no way that we can get rid of sin, right? This is all, you know, throughout human history, there's been different movements and different nations and whatever trying to say, oh, we can somehow create this perfect, place where there's no, no, we can never get rid of sin. Scripture tells us, meaning the law tells us all this stuff tells us as we see failure after failure, right? That we're all under the power of sin, meaning sin is a force that is going to, we're, we're prone to, and we can't get away from it. But is that the end of the story? No. So that, so that, this is very interesting, through faith in Jesus Christ, the promise might be given to those who believe. So why are we consigned why does god allow us this is what god allows why does god allow us to be consigned under the power of sin why does he allow us to be people who are prone to sin because he allows this right god allows this to be the case why is that the case he never sinned, he a exactly so that we could come to realize that we need a savior so he consigns all things under the power of sin meaning just basically what is that saying essentially it's basically what your translation just said which is essentially that we're all basically prone to sin. We all are sinful human beings, right? Why does he allow this? Why is he, essentially, it's the question, why does he allow Adam and Eve to fall, right? Why does he allow that to happen? So that we can come to believe that we need a savior who is Jesus Christ. And how, and again, this is the concluding line for this whole section. And how is it that we come to be saved by knowing Jesus Christ through faith? Faith in what? Faith in the promise that was given to Abraham and to his descendants. So this, this verse kind of is a summary of everything he was just saying. It's basically saying we're sinful human beings. Like we don't have the power to save ourselves from sin. Why does God allow that? So that we can realize that we need somebody to save us through our sin. Who is the one who saves us from our sin? 
is Jesus Christ to whom the promise had been made. And how, what is the way in which we actually access that salvation through Jesus Christ through faith? That's puts a, puts a bow on the whole thing. But again, faith, which is just to go back to, we always want to reiterate this, right? Does that mean that once we come to faith and we're fine, we're done, we don't have anything else to do? No faith that's expressed in our works, including at times the works of the law, even Paul says, right? It's expressed in the way that we live our lives, because um, as James says, right, faith without works is is dead, right? Meaning if we come to faith, but then we're just doing whatever we want, no, right? So that faith needs to be renewed again and again. But primarily it's through an act of faith in Jesus Christ that we are liberated from the power of sin that's over us, and we're able to walk with grace, right? We're able to walk with Christ. Any other comments or questions? Or, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just want to make sure. Yeah, I, sure. I understand this correctly. So uh, God's promise to Abraham is universal. That means it's retroactive. So Abraham's mother, for example, also received the promise in all of her ancestors. This is an excellent point. Yeah, yes, the, the implication of what you're saying is true, meaning, okay, so um, this is why it's so powerful. So what he's, what, what, what is Paul saying here? He's saying that, what is it that makes us children of Abraham? What is it that makes us heirs to the promise of the kingdom? Which essentially means, what is it that saves us? Because what are we talking about? We're talking about salvation, right? What is it that saves us? It's faith in Christ. Now, what happens if there's somebody who doesn't doesn't have the opportunity to have come to explicit faith in Christ? People that pre-existed Abraham, even the people that existed after Abraham, the chosen people, right? They didn't know Christ, right? But we still believe that many of them were saved, right? And how were they saved? Well, they were saved because... In the way that they were able to, they were making through their through what was revealed to them, they were making an act of faith. And even if they didn't know it, they were making an act of faith in Christ. Right. So this is what the church believes also about like people who who are, you know, what if somebody is born in the bush of, you know, whatever, Africa or something, and they never have the chance to know Christ. Is that person just consigned to hell? There's some Christians who would believe that. Right. What does the church say? The church says we can't be judged based on something that we didn't have the opportunity to know. Right. So this goes also for people that lived before Abraham or the people that lived before Christ, right? We can't be judged based on something that we didn't have the like if we didn't have an opportunity to know it. And then God says to us, Oh, did you believe in Christ? It's like I have never nobody ever told me about Christ. Like, how did I how would I do that? So they're based on their judgment is based on what they were what was revealed to them. So we would understand that, you know, all people can come to some idea of the natural law, the natural moral law that exists, even apart from if they don't know God necessarily, they don't know Christ, they can come to some uh, idea of what the natural moral law is. And so their judgment will be based on how they follow that. So did they live a righteous life based on what was given to them? Um, but even those people who are deemed to have lived a righteous life and then are, are saved, they're saved through Christ, which is the crazy thing. Even if they didn't explicitly know Christ, Christ is the savior of all men. So anybody who comes to through, through salvation is saved through Christ and through the church. This is what it means to say, you know, in the, we just talked about this last night also in RCA because people have questions about this, this whole idea of extra ecclesiam nulla salus, outside of the church, there is no salvation. What does that actually mean? It's true. It doesn't mean that if you're, you can only be saved if you're in the visible bounds of the church. It means anybody who comes to salvation is saved through Christ and actually through the church because the church is a bigger reality than just an institution. It's, it's the community of those who are the children of Abraham, who are followers of Christ. So it's a mystical reality that actually, which is a great point you just made, actually in some sense precedes even Abraham. And this goes back to this whole idea of what God is outside of time, right? So God is outside of time and therefore the promise is that is made is something that goes beyond just our, our understanding of time. So this we could talk about this for hours, but that's a great point. I just wanted to point out, we have, thank you, Pat, we have one of our listeners uh, put a comment in based on, we were talking about that verse, Scripture can find all things under the power of sin. She says that her, her says scripture has locked all things under the power of sin. So interesting, uh, sim similar to saying can find, but thank you for the, for the uh, comment. I am watching the comments. So if it's something like that, I will definitely uh, mention it. So thank you. Great. So that was, I think a good, uh, we good. So we only got through 15 through 22. Okay. So, um, but there's so much there. So next, next week, we're going to be talking about the fourth argument he presents. I think this third argument was for me, like the most, it's just very impactful, very powerful. It was that. So I think we had a longer kind of period on it. Um, the fourth one, as we're going to talk about, he gets into in verse 23, but it's, it's very similar to what we just talked about though. The idea of the law as a disciplinarian, as a custodian. So,
Um, we'll get into that next week. Okay, so we'll end with our prayer and blessing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we give you thanks for gathering us together once day to once again this day to study your holy word. We ask that you continue to open our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our spirits to be attentive to that holy word speaking to us. And we especially give thanks for the great gift of knowing your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the knowledge of salvation that has been given to us, that we are to be heirs of the promise given to Abraham, given to Christ, given to each one of us as well. We ask that you help us to do all we can to witness to and to testify to our hearing and our acceptance of that promise in our lives by our works of faith, hope, and charity. And we ask that you help all those who are seeking, all those who are lost, all those who are lost in their transgressions and sins to come to see the great value of this promise that was given to us, to each one of us. Lord, I ask now your blessing upon all those here present and all those who are watching and listening with us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.